Community Engagement at JTS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our current lecture series, The Other in Jewish Text and Tradition. Um, special welcome to any first time attendees, and uh, you can view the recordings of past sessions using the link in the email that you received from JTS earlier today. Um, we are so pleased to have Dr. Yonatan Bravman teaching us today. His session is called The Self, the Other, and God in 20th Century Jewish Philosophy, Cohen, Buber, and Levinas. Uh, so something quite different from, uh, from previous sessions, really delving into this question um, through a philosophical lens. So thank you so much in advance, Professor Bravman, for, for teaching us and, um, and sharing this new angle with us today. Um, we want to thank today's Sadiq sponsor, Yale Aspel, JTS trustee. Thank you so much, Yale, for making this session possible. Um, if you are feeling inspired by this opportunity to engage in Jewish learning with JTS's outstanding scholars, we invite you to consider partnering with us by sponsoring a webinar. Um, we have two sponsorship levels, Chacham at $540 and Sadiq at $1,000, and you can learn more by contacting Learning Lives at jtsa.edu. So thank you again to Yale. Um, just to review our Q&A procedure, so Professor Braffin will um, pause a few times for questions, and we use the private chat feature to do that. Um, Tani Schwartz-Herman is going to be handling Q&A today, so you can send her a private chat, Tani Schwartz-Herman, with questions for Professor Braffin, and when, when uh, he reaches the Q&A periods, um, Tani will select from among the questions that have been submitted. Uh, if you have questions of a logistical nature, you can, uh, or technical nature, you can send those to Lynn Feynman via private chat as well. Um, the sources for today's class were also in the email that you received. And, um, and just so everyone knows, ev everything related to the series is all on um, the, the series page on the JTS website, which we refer to in every email, um, jtsa.edu slash the other in Jewish text and tradition with hyphens between those. So you can always find source sheets as soon as they're posted, recordings of past sessions, it is all there. Um, all right. so. Let's uh, turn now to Professor Braffin, who is Assistant Professor of Jewish Thought and Ethics at JTS and the director of our MA program in Jewish Ethics. Um, his research focuses on the intersection of Jewish thought, Jewish law, and contemporary moral and legal philosophy. Professor Braffin, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that warm introduction. <clears throat> Thank you for having me here. I've heard wonderful things about um, how the series has gone up until this point and about the engagement that, that it's had. Um, and I really hope to, to continue that. Um, before I begin, I also wanna thank Yale Ospel uh, for sponsoring this, this, uh, this learning session. Uh, Yale is really um, a patron of JTS and someone who's not only you know, supported financially, but I know for myself, you know, very much engaged in the scholars uh, and the teachers at JTS. So I just wanna say thank you to him before I begin. Um, as, as Rabbi Andelman mentioned, um, we're taking a little bit of a turn here uh, from perhaps primary texts or history, uh, classical texts, uh, to philosophy. And I actually want to start with, with um, the opposite of a warning, um, an, an invitation to philosophy. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is um, really diving in and digging into some you know, fairly difficult texts, which I hope to unpack together with you. Um, when I teach my students here at JTS, uh, they often think, or come to philosophy or Jewish thought classes with this conception that philosophy is some sort of esoteric wisdom. Um, and what I try to convey to them is that philosophy is really something that they're already doing. Philosophy involves thinking in a sustained and critical manner about things that all of us in our lives are already thinking about. And what we're all gonna do is to do that um, more rigorously together um, and collaborate in order to shed light on questions that we are all already struggling with. And I think that's even more the case um, as we turn to our topic for today, the self, the other, and God in 20th century Jewish philosophy. We are all selves. We all relate to other people. And probably very many of us you know, have ideas about God. And so what we're going to explore today um, as we study the thought of Cohen, Buber, and Levinas um, is to try to get a grip with them as a guide a better grip on these on these ideas. So I take actually our guide word uh, for our discussion today 
uh, from a text that is, you know, very familiar to us as well. Leviticus 19.18 says, Love your fellow as yourself. I am the Lord. Right? Love your fellow as yourself. I am the Lord. And we see in this biblical text the, the, the joining together of, of three ideas, three entities. Right? We have your fellow, your neighbor, the other. Yourself, as yourself. Right? So you, who you are. And I am the Lord, your God, God. So already in this biblical text, we have the joining together, the conjunction of the self, the human other, and the divine other, God. And the thinkers that we're going to explore today, Cohen, Boover, and Levinas, are all reflecting on the interrelations uh, among those, those entities, the relationships among those ideas. So here are some questions for our discussion today. First and foremost, what are the relationships among the self, the other, and God? Namely, do we know ourselves first? Right? Do we know ourselves more intimately than everything else? And only then, after a certain amount of self-knowledge, come to relate to other people and to God? Or is it entirely the opposite? Do we relate to other and God first? And only then, at the end, come to know ourselves? A second group of questions. To speak of the, the other, the human other, and God brings religion and ethics into the picture. So what are the connections between religion, our relationships to God, and ethics, our relationships to other people? Does God command us to be ethical? Or, as we'll see in the thought of Levinas, or rather, do other people provide for us the entryway into God? These are the questions that we're going to be discussing today. And I hope as I you know, preface my uh, my discussion, you know, these are things that you've thought about, maybe not in exactly the same way, maybe not exactly using the same terminology, but what are the relationships between ourselves, other people, and God? What are the, what's the relationships among ethics and religion? Here's our roadmap for today. First, we're going to begin with Cohen. He's going to move us from ethics to religion, and as we'll see, back again. Then we'll turn to Buber who will convene a dialogue among the I or the self, the thou, the you, and the eternal thou, God. Then finally, we'll turn to Levinas, who will talk about the other, the human other, the other other, we might say, God and the self. And the, the, the order of those for Levinas is, is very important. That's the other, the other other God, and then finally the self. So for each of these figures, we're going to move through them sequentially, but I want to convene a dialogue amongst them. We'll see how each of them were responding to each other's thought and devising their own views uh, in the process. I'm also going to give you a bit of background, philosophical background, um, in order to understand what are the moves, what are the interventions, why is you know, this figure making this claim? So in addition to exploring the self, the other, and God in 20th century Jewish philosophy, we'll see how Jewish philosophy existed alongside debates in the general culture um, and devised its own views in response. So to begin with Cohen, who teaches us from ethics to religion and back again. Sorry. All right, I'll have to bend over to get it. We begin with Cohen, who was born in 1842 and lived to 1918 in Berlin. Cohen, we in Jewish studies know him as a scholar um, who wrote Religion of Reason out of the Sources of Judaism. But Cohen is also known as one of the founders of neo-Kantian philosophy, a return to the philosophy of Immanuel Kant um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. In fact, Cohen began his career by writing commentaries on each of Kant's critiques. Kant wrote three critiques. Cohen wrote commentaries on it and then devised his own system of philosophy. Importantly, this system of philosophy was meant to stand on its own. It's not uniquely Jewish. It was supposed to be a general account of what it is to think, what it is to act morally, what it is to enjoy something artistically. He also, though, wrote a book called Religion of Reason out of the Sources of Judaism, as I mentioned. And what this was doing was to think with the sources of Judaism, 
in order to develop a concept of religion, a religion of reason that he believed to be moral and universally acceptable. So in order to understand Cohen, Cohen's thought, we need to situate him um, in the history of Western philosophy. We don't have time for the whole history of Western philosophy. I'm just gonna focus very briefly on two important figures. The first is Descartes and the second is Kant. Descartes famously says, I think, therefore I am. Again, kind of a, a, you know, a, a, a catchy saying that perhaps you're familiar with. But I, what I wanna focus on that phrase in the context of our discussion today, right? What comes first, the self, the other, or God? For Descartes, I think, therefore I am. The human self establishes itself first. It's our self-knowledge, it's our thinking that allows us to exist. And then on that basis, we can go on to secure knowledge, a relationship to God or knowledge of God and reflect upon our relationships with other people. Right? But it begins with the self for Descartes. Kant is one of the founders of modern moral philosophy. He makes the focus of morality are acting in accordance with our moral duty. For Kant to act morally is to act purely because it is the moral thing to do and to act kind of universally, right? There are no kind of particular moral duties. There are those that apply to everyone. He writes, and I'll unpack this as I go, since I've deprived the will, the human will of every impulse, every motivation that could arise for it from obeying some law, nothing is left but the conformity of actions as such with universal law, right? For Kant, if we act morally because we're overcome by compassion or because we want to be rewarded, that's not moral action. Moral action is purely doing something out of a sense of your moral duty. So Kant says, if I take away all the motivations, all the incentives, all the desires out of our will, the only thing that's left is this idea of conformity of actions as such with universal law, acting in some ways that's universal, that transcends each of us which alone is to serve that will as its principle. And that's what we're going to act on the basis of. So what is that? It's this claim, what Kant calls the categorical imperative. That is, I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. Kant thinks that in order to act morally, we need to think about, could everyone act in this way? I wanna do this. This is the act I am about to perform. I think about, is it consistent for not just for me to act on that basis, but to will that everyone act on that basis? And that's what Kant thinks is the standard or the, the procedure for testing what is in fact moral. The thing to realize here is that Kant too moves from the self to other people, right? Kant is focused on ethics. Kant wants us to treat each other well, but the way that we determine how to treat other people ethically is to think about what we will to do and then think about if everyone could do that. So we move from the self to the other. Kant thinks that we also get um, that, that ethics is what allows us to establish religion. He writes, these postulates of practical reason are those of immortality, of freedom, and of the existence of God. For Kant, we can't know whether God exists, we can't know whether we are, are immortal, or even if we have a free, freedom of will. But he thinks that there are certain features of morality, there are certain features of practical reason, our thinking as it engages in reflection, uh, an ethical reflection that requires us to affirm immortality, freedom of the will, and the existence of God. What this means for Kant, and this is gonna be important for Cohen, is that God is a moral ideal, right? There's never a conflict of God tells me to do something and maybe that's immoral. The only knowledge that we have about God is because of ethics. Our knowledge of God is a moral ideal. Now, Kant has said to this point some very nice things about how we determine uh, what our ethical obligations are and the implications of that uh, for, um, for God. He also had a view on Judaism. In his famous work, Religion Within the Boundaries of Mere Reason, he writes, the Jewish faith, as originally established, was only a collection of merely statutory laws supporting a political state. In this, Kant is very much influenced by Spinoza's discussion of 
uh, Judaism and the theological political treatise. And Kant thinks that Judaism isn't really a religion. It's kind of the political constitution of the ancient Israelite state. And the only thing that Jewish uh, laws, the commandments, um, aim for is material uh, prosperity and political success. It's precisely not in order to fulfill the moral law. And so for Kant, the Jewish faith is not really a religion, one that's oriented towards the service of this moral ideal of God, but rather is merely a political um, faith. So let's get back to Cohen. As I've said, Cohen is one of the most premier scholars of Kant's thought. He is also not just a historical scholar of Kant's thought. He thinks that Kantianism gets a lot of things right. And so he develops his own system of philosophy in relationship to it. He is also, though, a committed Jew. In fact, one of the first professors in Germany to hold a, a professorship, which is a unit, which is a which was a uh, governmental position at the time, without having converted. Cohen aims to prove that Kant is wrong. That there, you can develop a religion of reason, a religion of moral reason, out of the sources of Judaism. He takes for his focus, again, a very familiar claim in the Jewish tradition. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Right? Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. God is one. But Cohen translates this in a very unique way the uniqueness of God. He writes, Hero Israel, the eternal our God, the eternal is unique. From the unique God, the view of Judaism is directed to one mankind and in the same way to each individual man in his own uniqueness. I'm going to repeat that. Hero Israel, the eternal our God, the eternal is unique. He's quoting in his you know, idiosyncratic translation, the Shema. And then he writes, from the unique God, from this idea of God's achdut, which he translates as unique, the view of Judaism is directed to one mankind and in, in the same way to each individual man in his own uniqueness. So there's a few things going on here. First, Kant, uh, Cohen, like Kant, thinks that God is a moral ideal. He's not interested in kind of an entity that speaks to us. He's interested in an idea that guides our thinking and our acting. He also thinks that there is what he calls a correlation, a logical relationship among the self, our ideas about ourselves, about God, and an idea about other people. Specifically, he thinks that the idea of God's uniqueness, which for him doesn't mean that there's just one God. It means that God transcends everything in this world, gives rise to two very important notions. The first is humanity. Right? If there's one God that transcends each tribe and each nation, it means that there's this thing called humanity, right, which stands that God is sovereign over. The idea of God and humanity is the root of ethics. It's the root of universality, which Cohen thinks is institutionalized in the structure of the state, where each of us is a citizen. Each of us has the same political and legal responsibilities as every other one. So on the one hand, the idea of God's uniqueness makes God transcendent, makes there a humanity, one common humanity, right, over and against God, which expresses our ethical universal obligations to one another, and receives institutional form in the state. On the other hand, God's uniqueness means that God can relate to us individually, right? He says, and in the same way, each individual man in his uniqueness, right? God is something that we can each have a relationship to. For Cohen, this is the idea of religion, the idea that we are particular individuals, that we are all unique in our own way, and we all bring that to our private relationships with God. For Cohen, this receives institutional form in the congregation, right? Where individuals in their idiosyncrasies, 
with their own histories joined together and relate to one another. What I want you to see is that for Cohen, there's kind of two sequences of relationships, right? There's God and humanity, where each of us are equal and have the same responsibilities. And then there's God and our individuality, where we meet in our particularity, our idiosyncrasies, and we recognize one another for them. I'm going to develop these ideas further um, as we proceed with Cohen's thought. So discussing this ethical relationship between God, the human being, and the other, he writes, the unique God therefore also unifies the concept of man, and every breach in this unity of man is a violation of morality. The relationship between man and man, between the self and the other, form the lower, or rather the inner correlation of God and man. Again, God, who is transcendent of all tribes and nations, constitutes us as a humanity, and so makes each of us relate to one another ethically, universally. Sounds good so far. But Cohen thinks that there are limits to ethics. Ethics has what it encompasses and what it leaves out. He writes, in ethics, the eye of man becomes the eye of humanity. Besides the eye, and distinct from the it, there arises the he, right? another human being, he or she. Is the he only another example of the eye, which is therefore already established by the eye? Right? When we think about other people as a he or a she, right, we think of them as kind of a copy of us. We're all a he or a she. Right? You call anyone he or she. I could be called he or she by someone else. Language alone protects us from this mistake. Language sets up the thou or the you, right? When we point at someone and speak to them directly, is the thou also another example of the I? Or is a separate discovery of the thou necessary, even if I had already become or of my own I? Perhaps the opposite is the case, that only the thou, the discovery of the thou, is able to bring about the discovery of the I. What Cohen is pushing at here is that there's a way in which in ethics, as majestic and as obligatory as it is, all individuality is wiped out. Each of us is the same as everyone else. We all have the same ethical obligations and rights. I am exchangeable for someone else. What Cohen is saying is that that leaves out two other things. The you, right? When you focus on someone directly and what makes them different from all other people. And another understanding of the I, the I, how I am unique, how I am, am different from other people. To get at this, we need to transcend ethics and transition to religion. Cohen thinks this happens in a very interesting way. He thinks that what allows us to transition from the universality of ethics to the particularity of religion is through the experience of suffering. He writes, it's precisely through the observation of the other man's suffering that the other is changed from a he or a she to the thou. Suffering, the passion, is for the sake of compassion. In the realm of ethics, we have ethical obligations, we have ethical commitments and rights, and each of us has the same ones. It's when we experience another person's suffering, suffering from physical illness, from economic degradation, that we are exposed to them in their particularity. It is in that very basic experience of suffering that we realize that this person is different than other people, even though everyone might suffer in their own specific way. This is what transitions us from the he or the she to the thou. He writes further, when a human being begins in pity to love another human being, this implies a transition from the notion of just the next man, it's someone who's just next door to us on the train, to the fellow man, someone we share our life with. Religion achieves what morality fails to achieve. Love for man is brought forth, right? not just doing our duties, but rather loving the other. 
as a miracle, as a riddle, it emerges from the head, or rather, from the heart of man. Now, I want to import, I want to, I want to, I want to kind of note something important. What Cohen isn't saying is that, like, we go beyond ethics and now we're doing religion. All of our ethical obligations, the idea to treat everyone equally and universally, stay in place. What Cohen is saying is, is there something beyond that? Is there a way relating to someone that takes ethics for granted, but then extends our, the lines of relationship? And for him, this is what experiencing the suffering of the other is about, and it's the uniquely religious experience. We've talked about how we discover the other person in their particularity through experiencing, seeing their suffering. But Cohen thinks the same thing happens in terms of our self-discovery, our discovery of ourselves. And here I'm indebted to the great work by uh, my colleague Shira Billet at unpacking the role of intersubjectivity in Cohen's thought. When we think about the ethical self, as I've already mentioned, according to Kant, the ethical self is the bearer of universal moral obligations. Ethics is defined by what everyone could will. We are not dealing with the in individual, the particular idiosyncrasies of the person. Tolstoy says, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Here's a way into Cohen's thought about the transition from ethics to religion. I would say that Cohen says, ethical selves are all alike. Right? Everyone has the same ethical obligations, but every unethical self is unethical in its own way. In the realm of ethics, we all have the same moral obligations and duties. It's the way in which we fail. It's the way in which we don't succeed to fulfill our obligations that makes us particular and individual. It's what requires us as sinning individuals to engage in repentance or tshuva, which according to Cohen makes us real individuals. He writes, if now, however, through suffering and compassion, the thou in man is discovered, even one's own suffering need not be accepted with plain indifference. To have compassion with one's own suffering does not have to be simply inert and fruitless sentimentality. Corporeality, our bodies, where we, the locus of our suffering belongs to the soul of the individual, and the soul is neglected when the affliction of the body is neglected. Humanity requires consideration for one's own suffering. With the suffering of the eye, other injuries, besides those of the imperfection of the senses, also come to light. Moral frailty, failing in our obligations, now needs renewed examination. If then religion has its deepest basis in man's self-knowledge, then Ezekiel stands immediately besides Socrates. What Cohen is saying is that the experience of our own suffering, right, whether it's bodily or economic or professional or personal, right, this makes us aware of our individuality, of our particularity. Now, Cohen says something interesting that might be a bit disturbing. He says that when we suffer in this way, we should use it as an occasion to think about our not just bodily frailty, but our moral frailty. We should use it as an occasion to examine whether we have succeeded in fulfilling our ethical obligations, our obligations to other people. Now, I want to add quickly that what Cohen's not saying. Cohen is not saying that we suffer because we are bad people, because we failed ethically. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't believe that you know, there's reward and punishment in that way. What he is saying is that the occasion of suffering, the occasion of suffering provides an event through which we can reflect on our moral successes and our moral failings. And when we do that, we can discover um, the ways in which we have succeeded, the ways in which we're fail, we've failed, and the ways in which we can do better. He links this idea, he sees this idea expressed in the prophet Ezekiel, which he says, if Socrates inaugurates philosophy, then Ezekiel inaugurates religion. Ezekiel 18, 27 through 31, this is Cohen's translation. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he committed and does that which is lawful and right, <clears throat> he shall save his soul alive. Cast away from all your transgressions where ye have transgressed, and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Cohen comments on this passage. The new man is born 
In this way, the individual becomes the I. Sin cannot prescribe one's way of life. A turning away is possible. Man can become a new man. This possibility of self-transformation makes the individual an I. Through his own sin, man becomes an individual, right? Comes, becomes particular. We all fail in our own ways. Through the possibility of a turning away from sin, however, the sinful individual becomes the free I. And only with this newborn man can the correlation, the relationship between God and man become true. God does not want the sinner and his death, but he has pleasure. God has pleasure in man's turning away from his ways and therefore in his life, in his new life. Now the individual comes to full fruition in the eye. The experience of our own suffering, in Cohen's view, leads to this examination of our moral frailty. That allows us to realize how we are each particularly sinful, how we each individually fail morally. But this provides an occasion for us to push forward, to engage in repentance, to become new, reborn human beings. So I want, I want to return to that quote with which we started examining Cohen's view. Hero Israel, the eternal, our God, the eternal is unique. From the unique God, the view of Judaism is directed to one mankind, and in the same way, each individual man in his own uniqueness. Cohen sees a correlation, a relationship among the self, the other, and God. In fact, he sees two such correlations. There's the transcendent God, which, as I've said, stands above all tribes and nations and constitutes us as humanity. Within humanity, each of us, self and other, are moral equals. We have the same rights and responsibilities directed to one mankind. But God is also directed the same in way to each individual in his own uniqueness. There's the compassionate God the God that recognizes us in our sinfulness and stands there as we repent and become a new person, right? where we can recognize our individuality. And in this relationship, we can recognize the other as a particular thou, right? as a particular human being who suffers. And we can recognize and constitute ourselves as a particular sinning and repenting I. In a small work, Cohen writes, the self results from the eternal relationship between the I and the thou. We're not always already an I and then go into relationships with, with other people and with God. Right? We result from those relationships. That is, it's the if infinite ideal of this ever-continuing relationship. The ideal always remains ideal. The task always remains a task, always remains infinite. Yet the ideal is defined by its demands for zealous em emulation, Hence, it opens up the possibility of coming closer. We are continuously developing ourselves, but only as mediated through our relationships to God on the one hand and to other human beings on the other. And this goes on on two levels, which I've already remarked upon, on the ethical of universality, as well as on the religious level of particularity. I want to pause now to take a few clarifying questions. I know I've thrown a lot out there enmeshed in kind of Cohen's particular neo-Kantian jargon. Uh, so before we proceed to Buber, who's engaging with Cohen's thought, I want to pause for some clarifying questions. Thank you, Professor Brofman. Um, just going to a few questions that came in. I'm just going to take a quick look. Um, But one question from, from Joe, um, how do any or, or all of these philosophers that you mentioned differ from um, philosophers such as um, Joseph Soloveitchik? Right, so I'll just start with Joseph Soloveitchik and maybe actually stay there. Um, Soloveitchik wrote his uh, dissertation on Hermann Cohen, uh, not on Hermann Cohen's um, uh, Jewish philosophy, but on Cohen's um, general philosophy. It was actually a critique of it which is important to know. Um, Soloveitchik was very influenced by Cohen's writings about atonement and repentance, especially this idea that we become a new type of self uh, through this. And this is an idea that Soloveitchik uh, draws from Cohen and then embeds more deeply than Cohen does in, in Jewish texts. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Question from um, Sarah Brooks. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, one of the slides, ethical selves are all, are all alike. Um, and this assumes that we all agree on what is the moral ch choice, but this isn't always true. So I don't think, can you comment on that too? Yes, yeah, so I'm just, yeah, so that's a great question, right? So I would make the distinction between us disagreeing about what is moral and the, the presupposition of that disagreement that there is one right answer about it, right? We might have lots of disagreements about what should be done, what should not be done. But the reason we're able to have that disagreement is that we assume that there is a right answer and a wrong answer. I just, you know, one person thinks that they're right and the other person thinks that they're right, right? So the fact that we have disagreements doesn't mean that we're not striving towards universality and that ethics isn't, isn't aiming for that. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from uh, Dale Brown. Um, you know, couldn't, couldn't good things cause moral reflection, reflection as well? Um, you talked about how suffering, you know, causes, you know, ref reflection. Um, you know, couldn't, couldn't good things also, you know, cause people to turn toward God and become a new person? Yeah, so I, I think that that's, that's, that's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, I think that Cohen is, uh, on the one hand, very skeptical of good things. Um, you know, I think he thinks that it often makes us complacent. Uh, it makes us kind of less probing of our own behavior. Um, and I think that he's focused on the suffering because of how that draws us back to embodiment, right? There's no way that the, the way that we're, we're each the most particular in like is in having particular bodies. And like, what he thinks is that suffering makes us acutely aware of our bodies in the way in which we might take for granted when, when we're happier. I think I'll take one more question before we move uh, to Boober, if that's okay. Okay. Um, okay, I had one, one other question from, from David. Um, Cohn disputed political Zionism. Um, how does this connect to his uh, philosophy? Yes, so excellent. So Cohen, Cohen, um, Cohen and Boober, uh, that's actually a good segue. Um, Cohen and Buber had a famous debate about political Zionism, which is not our focus today. It's going to be about the relationship between the self, other, and God. Um, Cohen, actually, given that it was written in the early 20th century, um, has some scary things to say about the suffering of the Jewish people uh, at the end of religion of reason out of the sources of Judaism. He thinks that um, the suffering of the Jewish people in exile, the way in which they don't have the ability to defend themselves, is kind of an index of the moral development of the world and kind of a testimony uh, to the uniqueness, ethical and religious uniqueness of God. Um, and it's on that basis that he opposes attempts to kind of ameliorate the Jewish experience, uh, to give Jews power uh, through things uh, like political Zionism. So there is actually a, a deep connection between his views about suffering and religion and his rejection of political Zionism, uh, which is perhaps for another day. Uh, but I do want to, as you point out, po uh, focus on some of the differences between Cohen and Buber. Right? We turn uh, to Buber, continuing with this relationship among the self, the I, the thou, as we saw Cohen describing it, and what Buber calls the eternal thou. So I actually want to begin with his critique of Cohen, which we can think about as the ethicization of Judaism. Right? We saw how Cohen distinguishes between ethics and religion, right? But what Buber points out is they're really the same thing, right? In that they're about how to treat the other per person well. The difference being between ethics and religion for Cohen is that you're treating them well in their particularity. Buber writes, the meaning of the act of decision in Judaism is falsified if it's viewed as merely an ethical act. It's a religious act or rather it is the religious act, for it is God's realization through man. There's a lot going on in this uh, sentence and we're gonna unpack it further. What I wanna focus on now is the critique that Judaism isn't just all about ethics, right? It is what Buber thinks of as a distinctively religious act, which in Buber's view requires decision decisive commitment of the individual to something, whether or not that is ethical or something else. 
We're going to unpack this quote further uh, in a few minutes. Before that, just a bit about Buber. Uh, Buber was born in 1878 in Vienna and died in 1965 in Jerusalem. Some, some of his selected works, one we'll focus on today, is I Am Thou. He, already, he also wrote The Origin and Meaning of Hasidism because he was very interested in the way in which Hasidic thought could revitalize Western European Jewry. Um, and his famous set of essays on Judaism, which we'll also refer to today. Boo, if, if Cohen was very much influenced by Kant, Buber is influenced by the move, uh, a move in philosophy away from ideas to lived experience. He was very influenced by tendencies associated with phenomenology and existentialism. Husserl, one of the founders of existentialism, described its credo as return to the things themselves. Return to the thing themselves. Don't kind of engage in abstractions. Don't rely on kind of ideas, ideals, but rather try to give us thick descriptions of average everyday experience. Husserl writes in his ideas, our first outlook upon life is that of the natural of natural human beings, imaging, judging, feeling, willing from the natural standpoint. In this way, when consciously awake, I find myself at, at all time and without ever being able to change this, set in a relation to a world which through its constant changes remains one and ever the same. It is continually present for me and I myself am a member of it. Therefore, this is not there for me as a mere world of facts and affairs, but with the same immediacy, a world of values, a world of goods, a practical world. What Husserl is pushing back against is kind of the philosophical view of the world, that there's kind of objects out there, there are things, and we're just walking around examining them and analyzing them. What Husserl is calling us back to is the way each and every one of us feels when our alarm goes off in the morning. When our alarm goes off in the morning, we hear an alarm, we know it's an alarm, we get up, we think about coffee or our kids or the job we have to do or the meetings we have planned for the day. Right? We're already, always already kind of enmeshed in a world and things are just kind of there for us. Right? We're not kind of taking this distanced perspective on things. And what Buber thinks, what, what Husserl thinks rather, is that we need to take that awareness into our philosophizing. We need to engage in kind of thick description of relationships and of objects in order to better understand them. Boomer is going to take this approach to the relationship between the self, the other, and what he calls the eternal thou, or God. In his famous work, I and Thou, Boomer begins by writing, the world is twofold for man in accordance with his twofold attitude. The attitude of man is twofold in accordance with the two basic words he can speak. The basic words are not single words, but pairs. One basic word, word is the pair I you. The other basic word is the word pair I it. But this basic word is not changed when he or she takes the place of it. For the I of the basic word I you is different from that in the basic I it. Boomer is saying that there are two kind of opposed ways of relating to the world, either what he calls I, you, or I, it. We're going to unpack what those different ways are in a second, but I want to just dwell on one part of Buber's statement here. We'll often think that I, you, and I, it, right, they're different because one is about a you, one is about an it. But what Buber is pressing down on here is that the I, the I and the I, you, and the I and the I, it is different as well. So when we're relating to things in different modes, we're also relating to ourselves in different modes. He writes, there's no I as such. There's no sense of ourselves kind of in general, but only the I of the basic word I, you, and the I of the basic word I, it. Right? There's only I in relationship to others as a you, or I in relationship to others as an it. So what are we to make of these two distinctions? Buber spends a lot of time elaborating kind of lavishly on it in keeping with his approach to philosophy, kind of thick description. I have it in a chart here. The I-you relationship, when we relate to someone as a you, right, directly, 
We relate to them in their whole being, right? how they are in their entirety. We encounter them and in some sense participate with them. Our relationships are spontaneous. Who knows what's gonna happen? We're not judging them based on how they've been previously or what people like them do. So we're open to how they might behave in this moment. We're aware of their presence. We have an unmediated relationship to them. We're not categorizing them. We relate to them as they are. We relate to them in the present, not based on the past or hopes for the future. We're also open to them relating back to us, that the relationship is reciprocal. This is all compared to I-it relationships. When we relate to something as an it, as a thing, right? we relate only partially to them. We relate in terms of how they can satisfy our needs or our interests at the moment. Right? We have a goal-directed experience with them. How can I get the most out of this experience? How can I you know, process this most efficiently? Instead of kind of spontaneously being open to them, we try to control them. We try to bend them to our will or bend in turn to their will. Alternatively, we try to con you know, collect information about from them, right? What's the weather like? Good stop stock tip. Our relationship isn't unmediated, it's conceptual. We categorize them. They are student, teacher, coworker, right? Not kind of them in their uniqueness. And so what Boover thinks is we're relating to them in view of a past, right? Our previous experience with people like them, as opposed to being in the present, in the moment. Instead of engaging in reciprocal action, kind of a give and play where we're open to them and they're open to us, we try to act kind of unilaterally on them. That's the major difference between the IU and the IIT relationship, which, which Buber thinks are kind of two very different ways of approaching the world. Importantly, Buber thinks that the IU relationship is basic. It's kind of our, un, our kind of immediate way of relating to the world, the way that we did as children, the way that uh, we do in the moments where we stop being so sophisticated. Right? It's only as we become kind of enculturated and modernized that we begin to relate to, to, to others as an it rather than as a you. And so what Boober is trying to do is to call us back to these IU relationships with openness to the whole being of the others where we have a reciprocal encounter with them. Buber thinks about the IU relationship in terms of love. He writes, feelings dwell in man, right? When we have all, when we're happy, when we're sad, they're kind of in us. But man dwells in his love. There's no, this is no metaphor, but actuality. Love does not cling to an I. It is between an I and a you, right? It's about that relationship. Love is the responsibility of an I for a you. Right? It's the way in which we are responsible for one another. But Boomer is also open to other emotions within the IU relationship. He says, hatred remains blind by its very nature. One can only can, can hate only a part of a being. Right? Boomer seems to imply that when we hate someone, we only relate to them as an it. But yet whoever hates directly is closer to a relation than those who are without love and hate. In some sense, Buber thinks that when we hate someone, we relate to them as an it. But at the same time, he thinks that what's worse than that is kind of a mere indifference, being without love and hate, because then we're not relating to someone at all. So we have the I and the you relationship versus the I and the it relationship. But Buber thinks that standing behind and beyond these IU relationships is what he calls the eternal you or the eternal thou. He writes, extending the lines of relationship intersect in the eternal you. Every single you is a glimpse of that. Through every single you, the basic word addresses the eternal you. The mediatorship of the you of all beings accounts for the fullness of our relationship to them and for the lack of fulfillment. It attains perfection solely in the immediate relation to the you that in accordance with its nature cannot become an it. So to unpack that, Boover is saying that there are two ways in which we relate to what he calls the eternal you or the eternal thou, 
to God. One is mediated by our other relationships. Right? When we really encounter someone as a you, them in their uniqueness, Buber thinks that this kind of intends or directs us towards some relationship to God beyond it. But he also thinks there are moments in which we encounter immediately or directly this eternal thou, when we have an immediate or direct relationship with God. Importantly, I want to stress that by a relationship with God, Buber does not mean that there's this entity called God and we can either have a relationship or not have a relationship with God. God for him is a relational category, right? He writes, for whoever pronounces the word God and really means you, addresses no matter what his delusion, the true you of his life that cannot be restricted by any other and to whom he stands in a relation that includes all others. But whoever abhors the name, rejects the name God and fancies that he is godless, when he addresses with his whole devoted being the you of his life that cannot be restricted by any other, he addresses God. For Buber, God is not some substantial entity that we can either have a relationship or not have a relationship with. God is relational. Whatever we ultimately can commit ourselves to, whatever we feel called to commit ourselves to and to enact in the world, Buber thinks that this is the eternal thou. This is what we can call God, even if someone describes themselves as an atheist. So God is relational for Buber as opposed to substantial. What's interesting here is he also redefines idolatry. Idolatry isn't worshiping, you know, this chair instead of God. It's rather trying to take something that is of ultimate value, of ultimate significance, that calls for an ultimate commitment, and to try to subordinate it to our own interests, to try to control it, to try to make it into an it. God is that which cannot be made into an it. It's what calls for kind of ultimate commitment and sacrifice. How does this relate to Judaism for Buber? Buber gives what we can describe as an existential interpretation of Judaism, one that's focused on this idea of ultimate commitment. He writes, in the religious life of Judaism, primary importance is not given to dogma, to beliefs, but to the remembrance and the expectation of a concrete situation, the encounter of God and men. Whatever is enunciated in abstract in the third person about the divine, right? Whenever we say God is this or God is that, is only a projection onto the conceptual plane, which though indispensable, proves itself again and again to be inessential. Israel's experience of the thou, right? Of the you, God speaking directly to us in the direct relationship the purely singular experience is so overwhelmingly strong that any notion of plurality simply cannot arise. Yehud, the unification, the unity of God, involves the continually renewed confirmation of the unity of the divine in the manifold of God's manifestations, understood in a quite practical way. Therefore, the unification is contained in translating the image in actuality in imitatio Dei. For Buber, Judaism is about the relationship between God and the human being. It's about being spoken to and speaking to God as a thou, as a you. In fact, as an eternal thou, something which cause, calls us to make an ultimate and undivided commitment to it. Cohen describes God's you, achdut as God's unity, God's transcendence, God's relationship to us when we sin. For Buber, God's yichud, God's oneness, is about unification. Just as God is one and indivisible, we need to totally commit ourselves to the relationship to God and what God asks of us. And in that, we imitate God. So back to the quote with which we started our discussion of Buber. He says, the act that Judaism has always considered the essence and foundation of all religiosity, right, the act which Judaism sees as basic to religion, is the act of decision, right? Committing oneself of divine freedom and unconditionality on earth. The meaning of the act of decision in Judaism is falsified in his view, if it's viewed as merely an ethical act. It is a religious act, or rather it is the, the religious act. 
for it is God's realization through man. Boover rejects seeing God as a moral ideal. He rejects the notion that religion, that Judaism is merely about compassion to other people. He does see it as relational, but it's one that issues in a commitment to whatever God demands of us, not just ethics. So let's compare Cohen and Boober. As I've said, for Cohen, he focuses on God's uniqueness, which on the one hand expresses ethical universal humanity, as well as the particularity, the individuality of each of us and of each other person. Buber, in contrast, focus on God's unification, God's kind of oneness. He sees that as related to an existential decision, right? a total commitment to the relationship between God and the human being. Right, in which we do what we take God's commands to us because we have that direct relationship between God, between ourselves and God as our other. I want to pause now uh, to take some clarifying questions about Buber before we turn to our uh, kind of last member of this trilogue, uh, Emmanuel Levinas. Thank you. Um, question from Nina. Um, what would does Buber's conception of ethics um, as religious behavior imply that atheists cannot be or behave ethically? So Buber, as we said, kind of wants to step back from concerns with ethics, right? He's rather interested in existential decision, right? He thinks that any sort of system of ethics um, denies kind of the immediacy of the I-thou relationship. He thinks that when we engage with someone as a thou, right? We will most likely love them, but he doesn't want to reduce it to that. He wants it to be open to whatever, you know, comes, comes about. In terms of religion and, and atheism, recall that for Buber, pe many people who describe themselves as atheists wouldn't be atheists on, in his terms. For him, the religious act, it doesn't have to do with, you know, worshiping this God or that God or performing certain behaviors, but rather it means committing oneself wholeheartedly to something. Thank you. Um, question from, from Lori Spear. Um, I guess, can you give a little more context to when or like in, in what situations the IU relationship exists? Um, and I guess, that, you know, to add to that, uh, yet another question kind of asking about um, if we're talking about groups of people, such as, you know, a group of, if you're teaching to a group of students, how can you respond to all of them as use rather than as it? Great, those are two great questions that allows us to kind of fill, fill out this picture. So I always use an example mainly because I teach, you know, predominantly young adults, that the best example of the IU relationship is like sitting at a campfire talking uh, to someone that you're romantically interested in. <laughs> you know, where you are just kind of totally open to who they are in, the individu in, in their individuality and, you know, want to share yourself with them um, and are not kind of categorizing them, right? Again, kind of this spontaneous, interested um, experience. You know, what Buber, what kind of the novelty of Buber is kind of on the basis of this perhaps uh, familiar experience, he thinks we can have it in all sorts of other contexts. He actually thinks we can have it with nature. We can have it with, with, with works of art when we're just kind of open to it, right? Not thinking about its price or how popular it is, but kind of open to what's expressed in it. So from these familiar experiences where we relate to someone as who they are, Buber wants us to become more aware of other places we can have that experience. Now, to get to your point about kind of how do you relate to lots of people in that way. Um, I think Buber is actually, despite the fact that he sounds very romantic, he's a little bit realistic, which in ways that we haven't been able to explore in this lecture. Um, he thinks that the I-it relationship is, you know, um, not bait, it's derivative, but it's necessary, right? If we want to function in the world, if we want to have modern politics, modern economies, right, we do need to kind of not stand around, have IU relationships all the time. What Buber wants us to do is to kind of focus on these IU relationships and then, you know, engage in IIT relationships when necessary. 
So, you know, if you're talking, giving this example, yeah, I think that when one's giving a lecture to 358 people, um, it's very difficult uh, to have IU relationships with each and every one of them. You know, but the idea is that enough of the character of the IU relationship kind of orients um, an IU relationship and provides an occasion for those IU relationships to develop, like email or phone or office hours or Zoom. Um, I think I'll take one more question before we move uh, to Levinas. Um, it's another question. Um, question about, is it possible that Buber's idea of wholehearted commitment, you know, is it, is it possible that there is a way for that to turn into idol worship? Yeah, so I'm going to answer that on Buber's terms, and then I'll, then I'll say a critical comment about that. So by definition for Buber, it cannot turn into idol worship. Because remember for him, right, God isn't defined as like this entity who created the world, but rather whatever we commit ourselves to totally. So he would say whatever people commit themselves to totally is their true God, right? So by definition for him, kind of total commitment can't lead to idol worship. The concern that I would have uh, and that perhaps Levinas has is People can commit themselves to all sorts of things, some of them terrible. Um, and you know, isn't that something that we should we should we should be worried about? Um, and with that, I actually I want I want to turn to our our next thinker, Emmanuel Levinas, who's going to talk about the other, the other, other, and the self. But first, I want to start with Levinas's critique of Buber, and it's focused on the reciprocity that um, Buber thinks is in the IU relationship versus what Levinas calls height. He writes, we shall direct our criticism, his criticism of Buber, mainly to the reciprocity of the I-thou relation, right? Remember that for Buber, I-thou is kind of open, totally symmetrical and recipro reciprocal. The originality of the relation lies in the fact that it's not known from the outside, but only by the I which realizes the relation, right? Levinas is saying that Buber is kind of taking a two kind of bird's eye view on relationships. Instead, Levinas says that we should focus on what the I in the IU relationship sees. The position of the I, Levinas claims, therefore is not interchangeable with that of the thou, right? It's not I and thou and they're on the same plane. We're looking at that relationship, our relationship to the other from the perspective of an I. The formal meeting is a symmetrical, Boover's view is symmetrical and may therefore be read indifferently from either side. The I and the thou are kind of equal. But Levinas argues, in the case of ethical relations, where the other is at the same time higher than I, yet poorer than I, the I is distinguishable from the thou, not by the presence of specific attributes, but by what he calls the dimension of height. Although Buber has penetra penetratingly described the relation, kind of the way in which human beings are first and foremost in relationship with one another, he has not taken separation seriously enough. What Levinas is saying is that Buber, despite his best efforts to kind of describe in detail relationships, Buber in fact takes a bird's eye view where the I and the thou are equal to one another. Levinas says if we take phenomenology, kind of this lived experience description seriously, we realize that when we're describing a relationship, we can only describe it from the perspective of the I, looking out, relation, re, having a relationship with the thou. And when we do that, Levinas argues, we realize that we're not equal to the other. The other has, is higher than us. What, we'll, what he means by that, as we'll see, is that the other makes a claim on us. The other demands things of us. We are obligated to the other. And so the relationship between the I and the thou or the I and the other for Levinas is unavoidably ethical in nature. So some background about Levinas. He was born in 1905. He died in 1995 in Paris. He wrote in kind of three different modes. He wrote works like Totality and Infinity, which are kind of hardcore French philosophy, uh, which have very little... Uh, reference to Judaism, but he also wrote nine, you know, Talmudic readings. He would engage in these seminars where he would read Talmudic texts and unpack them philosophically, which we won't discuss today. 
And he also composed essays, more accessible essays on Judaism, uh, Judaism for example, uh, his collection, Difficult Freedom. In order to understand Levinas' thought, we need to understand his philosophical and existential reckoning with Nazism. Levinas was convinced that Martin Heidegger, the famous or infamous philosopher of the 20th century, was one of the greatest philosophers in the world. And he was influenced by his phenomenological approach to philosophy, right, engaging in thick description. And yet, Heidegger's decision to join the Nazi party and to oversee the University of Freiburg as its kind of party chancellor or rector right, made Levinas think about, well, what went wrong? What went wrong, not just for Heidegger as an individual, what's gone wrong in philosophy such that it could give rise to Nazism? So just some details about just two quotes from Heidegger in order to understand Levinas's reaction to him. Heidegger writes, being in the world, this is crazy jargon. I'm going to unpack it. No, it should not make sense to anybody. <laughs> uh, he writes, being in the world amounts to a non-thematic, circumspective absorption in references or assignments constitutive for the readiness to hand of a totality of equipment. Any concern is already as it is because of some familiarity with the world. Right? Born out. Total gobbledygook jargon. Right? You have to spend a lot of time studying Heidegger to even make sense of that. I'm going to just kind of gloss it very quickly. What Heidegger is saying is similar to Husserl, that we are not kind of detached observers on the world primarily. We are in the world. We are being in the world. Again, when we wake up in the morning, when we walk into a room, we don't, you know, kind of analyze objects like aliens from outer space. Right? When I, when I get thirsty, I don't say, hey, there's this cylindrical object here that contains water. I kind of just pick it up. And I drink it because I have to clear my throat, because I have to give the lecture, right? I encounter the world with objects that are linked into my projects and things are meaningful to me because of my kind of understanding of their significance. This is what he calls being in the world. And we relate to objects as kind of enmeshed in our goals and our projects. But more importantly, we also relate to other people in that way. Heidegger writes, in clarifying being in the world, right, this kind of way in which we're kind of immersed, just kind of already swimming in things that are meaningful, we have shown that a bare subject without a world never is proximally, nor is it ever given, right? This idea that we're never just like a bare self. We're always involved in things. And so in the end, an isolated eye without others is just as far from being proximally given. If, however, the others already are there with us in being in the world, we meet them at work, that is primarily, primarily in their being in the world. What Heidegger is, is saying is that just as when I encounter a computer or a, or, or a whiteboard or a water bottle, I don't encounter it as kind of a de-worlded or disembodied object, but I encounter it in view of my projects, my activities, my interests, so too, Heidegger thinks, we're always in the world with other people and we encounter them given what's significant or meaningful to us. When I you know, walk into my classroom, right, I have an identity as a professor, as a scholar, and I encounter students. And I've got student A, student B, student C, right? And they fit into this role and in terms of what's significant to me. When I'm engaged in playing basketball, I relate to my teammates in terms of, in terms of our shared activity. What Heidegger is saying in both of these, when he talks about objects and when he talks about people, is that they're always already there. We don't kind of encounter them as kind of strange entities that we need to figure out. And that we understand them in view of what's significant to us, what's meaningful to us, what our projects are. Levinas, as I've already said, thinks that phenomenology is the right way to do philosophy. He thinks that engaging this thick description of human life is the way to gain philosophical wisdom. But he thinks that Heidegger has gotten the phenomenology wrong, that something has gone wrong in Heidegger's thick description of human experience. And instead, Levinas tries to develop what I call the phenomenological conditions for the possibility of ethics. The phenomenological conditions for the possibility of ethics. That's a mouthful too. What does it mean? It means, what does our experience have to be like? 
right? What are the phenomenological conditions? How do we need to see people? How do we need to relate to them such that we even pose the ethical question, such that we even begin to wonder how should I treat them? Right? If, you go to, if you go to Levinas to try to find answers to like, should I do this? Should I not do that? Levinas isn't good on that. What he wants to do is to, to get at something deeper. What does our experience have to be like such that we even try to think about what we should do? So in describing our experience, he writes as follows. A calling into question of the same, which cannot occur within the egoistic, egoistic spontaneity of the same, is brought about by the other. We are going about our lives, we're engaged in our own thoughts, what he calls the same. It's our encounter with the other pe person that kind of bursts that bubble, that calls into question our egoism. We name this calling into question of my spontaneity by the presence of the other. What do we call it? We call it ethics. The strangeness of the other, his irreducibility to the eye, to my thoughts, my possessions, is precisely accomplished as a calling into question of my spontaneity as ethics. Right? I try to act freely. I try to kind of pursue my projects. I try to pursue what's meaningful to me. But I bum it to other people. And those people kind of puncture my bubble. They make me think about whether I should be pursuing my projects, how it's in, uh, impacting other people. And here he addresses Heidegger indirectly. To affirm the priority of being, to say that being in the world is the most important thing over existence, over other people, is to already decide the essence of philosophy. To say, I want to describe being in the world and then I'll describe other people is already to decide the essence of philosophy. It is to subordinate the relation with someone who is existent, what he calls the ethical relation, to a relation with the being of existence, to what's meaningful, which impersonal permits apprehension, the domination of existence, a relationship of knowing, and it subordinates justice to freedom. What Levinas is saying is if we start with meaning, if we start with our projects and then try to see how other people factor into that, we've already decided the essence of philosophy, that it's about everything being the same, that it's about knowledge, and that it's about freedom. Instead, what Levinas says, we need to start with the relationship to the other. And if we do that, if we do that, then we're open to otherness, something different than ourselves. We're concerned with ethics. And our ultimate goal will be justice as opposed to freedom. Levinas describes this encounter with the other through the figure or the image of the face, what he calls the face as the epiphany, the appearing of the other. I'm only going to focus on the two top quotes here. What Levinas is doing is kind of trying to unpack, giving us a phenomenological description of the face of the other. He writes, the face is present in its refusal to be contained. In this sense, it cannot be comprehended. That is encompassed. The other remains infinitely transcended, infinitely foreign. His face in which his epiphany is produced and which appeals to me breaks with the world that is common to us. What Levinas is describing is the way in which kind of the view of someone else, feeling someone else watch us, kind of shatters us and makes us self-conscious. And he's riffing off an idea introduced by Sartre of imagine you're going about your day or doing something maybe a little bit uh, pernicious, and then suddenly you realize that someone else is watching you, right? And all of a sudden, you're not in your own head anymore. You're in the other person's head, trying to figure out how you're being perceived by them. The face of the other for Levinas disrupts us. We can't comprehend it, which is to say to control it, and it makes us question and self-conscious about ourselves. He writes further in Totality and Infinity, the presence of the face coming from beyond the world, beyond what's meaningful or significant to me, but committing me to human fraternity does not overwhelm me as a numinous essence arousing fear and trembling. It's not kind of the sacred that kind of I participate in or in awe of. To hear his destitution, which cries out for justice, is not to present an image to oneself, but is to posit oneself as responsible, 
both as more and as less than the being that presents itself in the face. When we encounter another, we encounter ourselves, we feel ourselves both as more and as less than the other. How? Less, for the face summons me to my obligations and judges me. The being that presents himself in the face comes from a dimension of height, a dimension of transcendence, whereby he can present himself as a stranger without opposing me as an obstacle or enemy. When I encounter another person, I encounter them as greater than me, as putting an obligation on me, as claiming me, as making me responsible to them. But I also experience myself as more than them. For my position as I consists in being able to respond to this essential destitution of the other, finding resources for myself, right? But I also feel like I'm more than the other because I'm called to give to them. The other who dominates me in his transcendence is thus the stranger, the widow, and the orphan, right? Alluding to biblical texts, to whom I'm obligated. Multiplicity in being, which refuses totalization and takes form as fraternity and discourse, is situated in a space essentially asymmetrical. And here we return to Levinas's critique of Buber. The I-thou relationship is not reciprocal, where we meet as equals and participate on, with one another. It's rather one in which the other puts a claim on me, obligates me, and in which I'm indebted to them. I must give to them. They are the stranger, the widow, and the orphan. Levinas thinks that these ideas are expressed in the Jewish tradition, principally through our reflections on God. He writes, to me, religion means transcendence. Religion is the excellence proper to sociality with the absolute, or if you will, in the positive sense of the expression, peace with the other. Religion for him means peace with what is not ourselves, peace with the other. The positive way of being concerned with God comes precisely from the alterity of man, right? The difference, the otherness of other human beings, from other human beings being outside of every genius, from his uniqueness, which I call the face. Proximity itself originally means responsibility for the neighbor, the signifying of the face in which we're all unique and particular and call and obligate one another defenseless nakedness, the very uprightness of an order of, of a commandment, thou shalt not kill. The obligation responding to the unique and thus of loving. The love of God for Levinas is the love of one's neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. Right? Love of God is love of the neighbor in his particularity, right? in the way in which his face calls upon us to respond. In fact, Levinas writes, criti criticizing other religions, the sacred that envelops and transor transports me is a form of violence. As regards the divine which other religions incarnate, Judaism is merely atheism. Levinas is saying that if God, the sacred, is something that pulls us out of this world, that takes us out of our relationship with other human beings, then as far as that's concerned, Judaism is atheistic. How does Judaism conceive of humanity? By experiencing the presence of God through one's relation to man. The only experience of God we have is in our relationships with other people. The ethical relation will appear in Judaism as an exceptional relation. In it, contact with an external being, instead of compromising human sovereignty, institutes and invests it. Here is a crucial phrase for him. Ethics is not the corollary of the vision of God. It's not that we see God, we encounter God, and then we go act ethically. It is that very vision. Ethics is the vision of God. Right? Because God only appears to the extent to which it's possible through the face of the other. Ethics is an optic. It's a way of looking at the world such that everything I know of God and everything I can hear of God's word and reasonably say to him must find an ethical expression. So for him, the only way that we can encounter God, and that is saying too much, is in being obligated by the face of the other. So if we compare Buber and Levinas about this relationship to the other or the thou and the relationship to God or the eternal thou, for Buber, there's a reciprocity between the I and the thou. We are equal. 
And religiosity is expressed through this kind of total commitment to something that calls us, whether or not it is religious or not. For Levinas, on the other hand, our relationship to what Buber calls the thou and what Levinas calls the other is always asymmetrical. The other claims me, the other obligates me. And our relationships to what is absolute, our relationship to God, what, what Buber would call the eternal thou is only ever ethical. In fact, we have no relationship to God except through our relationship to the human other. I want to move actually towards a general summary so that we have a few moments to get both clarifying questions on Levinas and general questions as well. So I will just kind of bring this together and then I'll open it up if people have clarifying questions about Levinas as well as kind of general questions, I, I welcome that. We have explored uh, in the last hour and a half views about the self, the other, and God in 20th century Jewish thought. The thinkers that we have studied disagree about a lot but they agree on two important points. First, that we don't start as a self. We're not kind of a self and then we decide to engage in relationships with other people or with God. The self is constructed out of its relationships with other people and with God. We are not a self before we engage with others and with God. We've also seen kind of a complex interweaving of religion and ethics, right? Where for Cohen, religion supplements ethics. Buber, religion is kind of different, separate from ethics, whereas for Levinas, it is fulfilled. Religion can only ever be ethics itself. We saw with Cohen, we moved from ethics to religion and back again. We saw how there is a universal ethics where God is transcended and constitutes a humanity where both the self and the other have universal moral obligations. We've also seen particular religion where the suffering of the other reveals the other in their particularity, and our own suffering exposes us as a sinning and repenting individual before God. We then turn to Buber, where we saw a dialogue we developed among the I, the thou, and the eternal thou. We unpacked his distinction between the I-thou relationship versus the I-it relationship. And we also explored what he calls the eternal thou, which is religious, in the sense of calling for ultimate, ultimate commitment, but may not be ethical. Lastly, just now, we explored the thought of Levinas, who focuses first and foremost with our relationship to the human other, then what we may call the other other, or God, and only then the self. The other that we encounter has a claim, right? Comes from a dimension of height. In fact, for Levinas, the self isn't a substantial thing. It only exists as a locus of obligation to other people. Finally, we explored his idea of God and the way in which God is the other other that is only present in the face of human beings and the ethical obligations that they place upon us. In each of these figures, we've seen reflections about the experience of human relationships out of the sources of Judaism. Each of them claim that Judaism makes a very particular claim, but in fact, something that is universal of human experience. And I hope that, that this has enriched our understanding of otherness um, in our religious tradition, as well as in ethics in general. I'll take some questions now. Thank you, Professor Ruffman. Um, a question from, um, David Cooper, he notes that um, Hannah Arendt um, also had to deal with Heidegger's acquiescence to Nazism. Um, how were she and Levinas different in regard to their responses to Heidegger? Great, that's a great question. So, um, so in a similar, in, in one sense similar in that what she wants to make primary is um, relationships to other. She has an idea called plurality, um, which, but she takes it if, if Levinas focuses on the other, kind of a dyadic relationship where there's one other that makes a claim on us, and he sees that as the entry point to ethics, Arendt wants to say, well, we're always in the world with a plurality of other people. And this raises the questions about politics. And for Arendt, Arendt's response to Heidegger is to take more seriously the plurality of human beings and the way in which that makes us responsible together for our common political life. Thank you. Um, question from Davida Charney. Um, 
she notes that um, Levinas, you know, at least in the material that you brought here today, um, that Levinas uh, writes about the Talmud while Buber uh, wrote about the the, the Bible. Um, she questions whether Cohn worked at all with sacred texts and also um, whether kind of the different texts that are noted, whether they're they're connected um, to their kind of different uh, ideas that they bring. Great, that, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so you're, so yes, so Levinas is trying to rehabilitate rabbinic texts. Um, and part of that is part of it, it, it is this corrective project that he's trying to uh, um, intervene in modern philosophy because he thinks the Hebrew Bible, right, has been kind of explored and taken up uh, through the medium of Christianity, but he thinks that something has been lost, and that's rabbinic literature, um, which expresses the ideas about obligation that we've been, that we've been describing here. Um, you know, Buber, yes, was engaged in the translation, the German translation with Rosenzweig of the Hebrew Bible, but, you know, I should also mention, as, you know, as I said, he was very interested in Hasidic tales, uh, which he thought uh, also provided uh, a dimension, uh, a needed dimension into, into philosophy and European culture. You know, Cohen dealt with the Hebrew Bible. He drew kind of more sporadically from rabbinic texts. He also wrote, as I mentioned, a book called The Ethics of Maimonides, um, which is more Cohen than it is Maimonides. Uh, but it was important for him to engage with a thinker of that kind of philosophical caliber um, as kind of a philosopher himself. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, question from Steve Kaplan. Um, questioning um, Levinas' view of God and what did Levinas think of prayer? Or to put it another way, why did Levinas pray every day? Oh, that's great. Uh, so I, I don't wanna speculate kind of psychologically on, on Levinas. I'll just mention something from the text that we discussed, like the broader text that we discussed today. Um, one of the excerpts was drawn from his essay, which is really wonderful called The Religion for Adults. Right? And he thinks Judaism is a religion for adults. And he sees um, religious ritual as playing um, a role in ethical cultivation. Right? He thinks that obeying, um, you know, praying or not eating certain foods or restricting one's activity at certain times makes us responsive uh, to something beyond ourselves in a way that's ethically um, beneficial. Okay, um, the question, about, just asking for further clarification on the use of the term phenomenology. Yeah, so phenomenology just, you know, very briefly, is this idea that the way to do philosophy is a method of philosophy involving thick description of our everyday experience, right? So instead of kind of writing logic proofs um, or reflecting on the relationships amongst ideas, what you'll do is you'll give a thick description of, in this case, human experiences or our relationships to objects and places and things. Um, and you know, it was inaugurated by Edmund Husserl, as I said, um, and you, we can describe Buber and Levinas as both um, engaging in phenomenology. Thank you. Um, I think we're just about out of time. So Professor Brockman, I, I just really uh, wanted to thank you again for teaching us today, for sharing such an incredible wealth of information and uh, you know, really giving us a new way to think of the other in, in the context of this series. Uh, so I just want to point out, if you look at the last slide, um, I know that, you know, I'm sure there are questions that I wasn't able to get to. Uh, if people want to have, if you didn't get to ask your question, please feel free to contact me at yobrafman at jtsa.edu, um, and I will try to respond to you. Yes, thank you. And, um, and I also uh, just wanted to make sure everyone's aware of our next session on March 15th. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to learn with uh, Dr. David Fishman. Uh, the topic will be when Jews made fellow Jews other Hasidism and its opponents. Um, he's going to focus on uh, this internal Jewish religious strife between Hasidism and its opponents. Uh, which led to the division of the community into rival denominations for the first time in nearly a thousand years. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to reflect on how the core principles of this dispute continue to shape our Jewish lives and guide our homes and institutions. So we hope you'll join us um, next week and um, thank you. If uh, Dr. Brockman, if you don't mind just uh,
taking down yeah. your PowerPoint. I'm just going to thank you so much. And I'm 